a summer long canoe trip in six months. I'm Elijah Greiner. I'm Josh Lambert. I'm Amos Kologi. I'm Chrissy Turk. I'm Jackie McDougal. And I'm Hunter Oliver. And together we called ourselves the Vagabond Voyageurs. <laughs> the last summer, the six of us paddled uh, over 1,200 miles from Grand Portage, Minnesota to York Factory, Manitoba. And those are both in red here. In blue is everywhere where we resupplied on our food. And this trip took us 84 days, which for reference before doing this trip, none of us had done a canoe trip over 14 days. We had all guided in the Boundary Waters, which is how we all met, but nothing even close to this big. So how did we go from having never done a big canoe trip before to one that is nearly three months long? Well, lots of planning. Last winter, the six of us were working in Ely, Minnesota when we first started talking about the idea of doing this trip. And in December 2021, all six of us were committed. And in yellow here is all the time that we had to plan. In green is how long the trip itself ended up taking. So as you can see with a trip this long, six months is not that much time to plan. We knew that if we wanted to make the trip happen, we had to start planning right in December. The good thing is, with the six of us being committed from the start, it allowed us to divide the planning six ways. And in a minute, we'll each go into more detail about each of our roles here. But the significant thing to note is that if any one of us had to do all six roles, had to plan the entire trip by ourselves, six months of planning would have easily taken three years. Every week, without fail, from December to the start of the trip, we met for our weekly planning meetings. This started in person and then uh, later over uh, uh, virtually. And we really believe that if we had not been so diligent about meeting every single week, that the trip would not have been as successful. We also use the chat platform Discord to keep each other updated. Uh, some of the reasons why we believe this is successful is one, when you have a trip so far out in the future, it's easy to procrastinate on it. So having meetings every week allowed us to keep trip planning a uh, top priority among our other day-to-day -day obligations. Another important thing is that because each meeting we were sharing new developments and discoveries and obstacles, we quickly found out just how interconnected all of our individual roles were. For example, before we could figure out where we were going to resupply for our food, we had to hone in on the route we were going to take. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sweet. Hello, my name is Hunter Oliver. I am from Dearborn, Missouri, and my main focus when planning for this trip was route planning. So something I discovered while route planning for this trip is that route planning itself is a pretty linear process when you're not doing other parts of the planning for a big trip. So I didn't have to juggle a bunch of things at a time. I could kind of knock them out in sequential order. So the first thing that anyone needs to do when you're planning a trip of any length is figure out where you want to paddle. For our group, that was pretty easy. From the get-go, we knew we wanted to paddle from Lake Superior to the Hudson Bay. So from there, it was kind of on me to piece together what specific waterways we would take to get from point A to point B. I used forums such as MyCCR and different books written by other paddlers to kind of figure out what waterways were navigable in between those two locations, and that helped me out a lot. So, once I had the overall route selected and what waterways we would take, I did a deep dive on each section. Um, this was probably the most important part of my route planning. The little things that you miss when you're researching waterways and sections of your trip can have big implications later on when you're making an itinerary or planning resupplies. So this was a really important part of the trip. I used a lot of the same resources I used to, just, to piece together the, the route in general. Um, but one thing I really did differently was I created something I called the Route Deconstructed, which was just a Google Doc that I broke down the route into little bite-sized pieces, either specific bodies of water or sections like the Boundary Waters or Voyagers National Park. And that helped me um, kind of tackle it in small parts so I could research one specific body of water and then once that was all done, I could do the next one. At our weekly meetings, I would come prepared to kind of present on a sp different body of water each week. Um, and I deep dive into how many days we'd be in the area, how many portages we could expect, um, rapids, uh, anything that seemed important to that specific body of water or section of the trip I would talk about with the group. I'd say one of my biggest regrets when route planning was actually that I stopped doing this after talking to the group about Lake of the Woods. I don't exactly remember why I stopped. Maybe it was I was too busy with work. Um, but if I had the chance to go back, I would certainly make sure everybody in the group was on the same page about later sections of the trip, because that helps a lot when you're out on the water, if everybody knows what's coming. 
Towards the end of the route deconstructed and researching the route, I started crafting an itinerary. So this is an example of what the itinerary looks like. Uh, it was really helpful for us to have the itinerary done early. Um, as you'll hear later, it was really integral to food planning and gear planning um, and even permitting later down the line. Our first draft of the itinerary was actually done in mid-January. We were able to get this done so quickly because we set parameters for the itinerary early on. We knew that we wanted to paddle an average of 15 miles a day. We knew we wanted a layover day about every six days of paddling. And we knew we had a start date of June 15th and an end date of September 8th. We had all of that figured out early, which helped really streamline this itinerary making process. I made this just on an Excel spreadsheet. Um, it has the day, the place we're gonna start, the place we're gonna end, and then the mileage for that day. Um, sometimes I'd include information about maybe how many rapids there would be on that specific day later on in the trip because that can really impact how quickly you'll move. Uh, my biggest recommendation when crafting an itinerary is to include weather bound days. So we had a week's worth, seven days of um, weather bound days that weren't part of the itinerary. These were days where um, if weather prevented us from paddling or un unseen circumstances would prevent us from paddling. These days were really helpful in the end when we were trying to get to York Factory um, and we made it there by our end date because of those days. The next task I had to accomplish was to order maps. Um, we, as you guys saw on the first slide, we ordered our maps um, through an official Canadian map dealer called World of Maps based out of Ottawa. Um, we decided to go with the 1 in 50,000 scale. It was the closest scale that they had available to what we were comfortable navigating with. We'd have a lot of smaller bodies of water on our trip and those 1 in 50,000 scale were really helpful for navigating those smaller bodies of water. Um, we ordered one set of waterproof maps from World of Maps. In hindsight, um, I would have definitely ordered two. What we did instead was to cut costs. We photocopied those maps, tried to waterproof them at home. As you'll hear again later, uh, those maps did not hold up very well uh, <laughs> after our homemade waterproofing. Um, but yeah, World of Maps was a great, uh, great dealer. They had a really great interactive website um, to make really, made selecting those maps that we needed really easy for me. And then the last thing I had to do, uh, once I had both sets of maps in my hand, was annotate them. Some people may disagree, but I believe that annotating your maps is super, super helpful when you're on your trip. You don't have to thumb through other resources, you just look down at the map right in front of you. And the big three things that I focused on were campsites, portages, and rapids. Um, those three things were always really helpful to just be able to look down and say, oh, there's a campsite two miles ahead, we should stop there for the day. Oh, we got a portage coming up. Um, I also would annotate points of interest in dams uh, when they came up. We did have some dams on the trip and not all of the topo maps that we got from that map dealer had every single dam on them, so I'd write some of those in. <clears throat> but yeah, annotating, I can't recommend it enough. It's, it's super helpful to do before the trip starts. So in conclusion, with route planning, um, for a trip this big, it can be pretty daunting when you're starting out, but just remember that you can kind of lean back on the fact that it's you can knock things out as you go. You don't have to juggle a bunch of things at once. Um, and my biggest recommendation when route planning is to use information that you can get from other paddlers, whether it be forums online, talking to other paddlers, um, reading what they have to say. That's going to be your biggest resource to tap into because paddlers love helping paddlers. My name is Amos Kloji. I'm from Hibbing, Minnesota. And I was responsible for planning the gear we take on this trip. So once we had our route figured out, we knew what challenges we'd encounter, and it was time to pick the gear. What we're gonna work on here is trying to answer a very important question. Before that question, we have to ask you a question. How many of you folks have gone on a multiple day long canoe trip? Okay, awesome. So with that being said, the question is, do you pack the same for a five day trip as you do for an 88 day trip? In a lot of ways you do, right? Your kettle pack is kind of sort of the same, you know, the way you're gonna carry your food is kind of sort of the same. What we're gonna go into is some of the considerations you should make for what's gonna be different. This is gonna change trip to trip, so we're not gonna give you folks a list of the gear we took, but rather try to bring you through some of the mindsets um, that we are in and some of the thought processes we used. First things first, your shelter and your tent. It's pretty important to make sure everybody has somewhere to sleep along the trip. Good for your mental health, good for your physical health to get good rest, especially over 88 days. So we brought three tents. The idea being, if we lost any one of those tents, whether it be because of a rapid or whether it be because of not enough space or a bear, who knows? There'd still be enough space for everybody to get you know, real rest, real sleep on the trip. So we brought two four-person tents and one two-person tent. 
bug protection on a long trip is pretty nice. I'm gonna be honest, I never used the bug shelter before this trip, I kind of scoffed at them. However, it was really, really, really bad bugs in over 88 days to have somewhere that you could eat, that you could meet, that was communal living space, that was out of the elements, just enough to kind of recharge you, because we all love being out there, but the bugs can get a little annoying after a couple weeks, a couple months. So I found it to be really important to have that kind of bug-free zone. Paddles, do you need a canoe trip? On a canoe trip, do you need a paddle? Absolutely, right? Consideration you should make for a bigger trip is if you need two paddles. We decided we did, because we had a lot of white water, and we just had a long ways to go in really remote areas. So we brought one set of really efficient, lightweight wooden paddles, and we brought one set of straight shaft, more durable paddles for the white water, and just in case we broke a paddle, we wouldn't be up the creek without a paddle. <laughs> Canoes, also arguably the most important part of a canoe trip, right? So, knowing the route, we knew we'd encounter white water, so we needed canoes that were pretty strong. We also knew that we encounter really, really big water, all of Lake Winnipeg, so we need canoes that were pretty seaworthy and efficient, right? Because we didn't want to wear ourselves out in all that flat water. We also had to carry these canoes to start for five and a half miles just for our first portage, let alone everything else on the trip. So we need a perfectly lightweight, super, super strong, efficient canoe. Uh, it kind of doesn't exist. So what we did is we took three <laughs> canoes, two of them were 10-year-old Kevlar's, and one of them was a brand new North Star Inegra fiber canoe. All the canoes are between 50 and 65 pounds, that way they're light enough for portaging. And although those Kevlar's were not the strongest material, um, we made some considerations with our repair kit to make sure we could get them to the end of the trip. Personal gear. This is one of those things that doesn't change a whole lot between a five day trip and an 88 day trip. One thing that might change though is the longer you're out, the more your sanity can really come into play. <laughs> Especially if you're with a group. Even if it's a group of really close friends that you've worked with, something you could bring for yourself to kind of help yourself check in, whether that's a emotional support frog, a guitar, whatever, can be really, really, really valuable and really, truly worth thinking about. Okay, now we're gonna move into some stuff that I think made our trip. So when it comes down to the make it or break it moments on an 88 day long canoe trip, our advice would be spray skirts. We had to go all the way across Lake Winnipeg, not to mention go through quite a bit of white water. What spray skirts do is they really increase your margin of error. And for us, that means that we could be more confident and we could paddle more on water that otherwise we wouldn't be able to. So we made two of these spray skirts and luckily got donated one by, when I say we, I mean my mother, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> and and on. Um, I really truly found them invaluable. Nope, not every trip needs a spray skirt, but it's really worth considering if you have really big water or if you're fairly inexperienced at white water, it just increases your margin of error. On that route, we found out that our last couple days was going through polar bear country. A lot of research you can do on polar bears, a lot of great advice out there. The main advice is you have to bring some sort of deterrent. It's a polar bear, right? Um, so our plan was to bring a shotgun to bring these bear bangers, which is pretty much a firecracker that shoots up in the sky and explodes, and then bear spray. Um, we'll talk more about what worked and didn't work with that a little bit later, but the idea was that we had researched our route and decided that we needed some sort of bear deterrent. Really big consideration for a big trip is a repair kit, because what's the goal of the trip? The goal for us, we decided at the very beginning, was to finish the trip. That was really, really important for us, right? Um, to finish the trip meant we had to be ready to take care of ourselves if something happened, right? We were pretty remote for some of these things, and the wilderness, your canoe is your best way to get out of the wilderness. So we made sure our repair kit was full of all the tools and all the epoxy and all the, the duct tape you could have. But along with that, that's kind of worthless if we didn't know how to use it. So we spent quite a bit of time, I spent quite a bit of time going through the kit and going through my mind of how to use the kit to put a canoe back together if we needed it. Another thing that made or braid our trip, and again, any big trip, you would bring uh, some sort of emergency communications and some sort of a first aid kit. Considerations for a really big trip, these two things are really important, right? You really don't want to lose them. So our plan with like, that's a Garmin inReach. It hooks up to your phone. Really awesome, really easy to use. Way more affordable than a satellite phone. Um, you can, we clipped it to someone's life jacket. So if we lost the person, we'd lose the Garmin. And we probably weren't gonna lose the person. <laughs> with the first aid kit, we decided to split it up at least a little bit. So if we lost an entire canoe, we'd still have some of our first aid kit left. And we left the bulk of the first aid kit, or at least usually tried to leave that in the most durable canoe. Now, all this stuff is great, the repair kit, the first aid kit, the bear deterrence, great if you know how to use that. And that's with all of our gears. So, gear is really important. 
You can use old gear and make it go a long way, but you gotta know how to use it, maintain it, and fix it along the way. So that was one of the biggest parts of this trip for gear planning was speaking to other paddlers. And other paddlers really love talking about a gear and then go to the exhibitions you know, hall and it's everything that's in there. Um, that was, I find the biggest tip is talk to other paddlers. You can make old gear work, but you're gonna have to spend some time on it. But make sure the gear you're bringing, you know how to work with and fix is a really big deal. The only thing I would have done different, if I had infinite funds, I would have brought three of those IXP canoes. The Kevlars were great, man, they didn't break that much, um, but it would have given us a whole <laughs> lot more ease of mind on the trip for a little bit stronger canoe. Hello everybody, my name is Jackie McDougall. I'm from East Granby, Connecticut, and my planning section for this trip was food and menu. Um, so starting right at the beginning of the trip, one of the biggest considerations for food was going to be our resupply strategy and how we were actually going to get the food itself. Um, so once the itinerary was figured out, I was able to go through the itinerary and figure out how many food carries we would need and how many days needed to be in each food carries. Um, our longest food carry was actually 18 days, um, so it was quite a bit of food at one time. Um, once that was figured out, then we had to figure out how we were going to get our food. Our first four food carries, um, we were gracious enough to have friends and family meet us in different towns and bring us food. Um, but for the rest of them, we decided that we were just going to go ahead and go to grocery stores in local towns. Um, a lot of people will mail themselves food, and that works really well if you're a smaller group and if you have dietary restrictions. Um, but we didn't really have that, and we figured out that the cost of shipping food internationally for 18 days worth of food was just going to be way too much. Um, so we planned on just shopping at local stores that we were paddling through. Um, and thankfully, we didn't have to go too far to, out of our way to, to get those resources. Um, another really important uh, job right at the beginning of the trip was for us to collect food. We had a lot of donated food and expired food we were really grateful to get. Um, and that allowed us to keep costs down. So we collected all that food, sorted it out, made it into an inventory so that we knew exactly what we had. And we started to um, do kind of like rough menu planning to split up that food um, evenly throughout the trip. So we actually had certain things that lasted us the entire trip. So we got granola that lasted us the entire trip, which is really awesome. And then a last consideration right at the beginning of planning was nutrition. I thought it was really important that for three months we were staying really healthy and we weren't losing too much weight. So looking into caloric um, requirements and also how to maintain um, protein levels and also vegetable levels. So um, what we ended up doing to make sure that we had vegetables is that we made a super green powder of a, uh, dehydrated spinach and kale and we could just add that to food. So little things like that to keep our nutrition up. Right before the trek, um, the job was to go through that menu again and solidify it a little bit more. Um, now a lot of people might want to plan out a whole menu um, specifically for each day for a three month trip just because it might make you feel a little bit more at ease. Um, but in our case we only had to do that for the first four resupplies because we had to give um, our friends and family the food to give to us. Um, from that point on, we didn't do too specific of a menu planning for things that we needed to purchase, just because we didn't know what was gonna be available to us in some of these remote towns. The more north you go, the less fresh produce you get and the less availability you get. Um, so for those first four resupplies, we went shopping, we organized the food, put it into piles, and then distributed that to friends and family. Now, pl planning is really important prior to the trek, and it took us six months to plan, but in terms of food, planning is an ongoing process throughout the entire trip. Um, so it's really, really important to stay on top of it. Um, we have a notebook um, that we keep track of our food inventory. We keep track of what meals have been eaten, what meals still need to be eaten. And then a really important job is to plan for the next shopping trip. So this was something that we kind of split up the task between crew members. Um, and a lot of times we'd actually go shopping and we'd still have to be super flexible because certain things weren't available in the grocery stores that we wanted to purchase. Um, and last but not least, what kind of food did we eat? We got really creative, had a really awesome time, and all improved our cooking skills throughout the trip. Um, for dinners, we did one-pot meals. Um, a great way to think about food planning for one-pot meals is just the formula of you need to have a carb, a protein, and a vegetable. And if you can think about that formula, then you can um, create a whole bunch of different meals with anything that you have availability towards. I mean, we were able to get vegetables in every meal, and um, we had a really awesome amount of food. No one was really hungry throughout the trip. But some fun things that we made, we made pizzas, we made cookies, um, calzones, um, lots of sandwiches and cinnamon rolls, so we had a lot of fun um, on our trip. Hello, I'm Elijah Greiner. I'm from the South Loop of Chicago, and my role was transportation. 
So getting to our jumping off point would be relatively easy. All we would need was a vehicle and a canoe trailer. So thank you to Doris Kologi and to Jan and Larry Baldwin for that. Getting home, however, would be much more challenging <laughs> and expensive. <laughs> Uh, transportation was the, the most expensive part of our whole trip, and as you can see, no roads or railways lead to York Factory, so how would we get home? Turns out the all-knowing Google was not particularly helpful. <laughs> Online resources were limited to one or two outdated web forums on the subject. One user suggested paddling up the shore of Hudson Bay to Churchill, and another suggested paddling up the Nelson River, and let's just say if either of those options were possible in Winona Champlains, we did not want to be the ones to prove it. <laughs> Our cheapest option ended up being a jet boat ferry ride from York Factory up the Nelson River to Gillum, Manitoba by a Gillum local named Clint, and at 900 Canadian dollars per person, this ended up being roughly half the price of what a charter float plane would have cost. Similar to a float plane, as far as logistical planning goes, we booked the shuttle in April, and from that point on, our end date in September was pretty locked in. But Clint was able to take all three of our boats, all six of us, and all of our gear in the boat in just one three-hour trip up the river, where then in Gillum, we were able to catch a passenger train south to Winnipeg. And once again, we were able to load all of our stuff right on. Via Rail has a 40 Canadian dollar flat rate for any canoe or kayak, and no hassle. <laughs> Then, once in Winnipeg, our volunteer shuttle driver Doris picked us up and brought us back to the United States. Hello, everyone. My name's Josh. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, and I was responsible for operating our social media presence, uh, as well as tracking our budget as we went along the trip and reaching out to some companies before the trip started to see if they were interested in supporting us at all with a little exchange of some promo on our accounts. Uh, we decided to create an Instagram and a Facebook account as well as a blog on WordPress, which you are more than welcome to check out the two blog posts there, but we unfortunately fell to the wayside with that as we prioritized all the other immense planning that had to happen before we could begin. They were essentially the same accounts, since you can cross post from Instagram to Facebook. The only major difference between the two was, as we mentioned with that Garmin earlier, you can actually link it to Facebook, and that allowed us to post our exact location as we moved along the trip, which was of course very appreciated by the friends and family and even the strangers that were following us along. Um, as they so kindly expressed uh, in the comments many a time. Um, so this is an example of what that post looked like. Um, as far as the genesis of the name of the account, it was mostly derived from my love of alliteration, and I think it's pretty fitting if I do say so myself, since we quite literally were vagabonds all summer long, um, and we're paddling to and from two iconic fur trading posts, which I'm sure almost everyone in the room is aware of, that the Voyagers played a, a very crucial, pivotal role in that process. Um, once we had that, Chrissy's sister, Court, made us some artwork. She's uh, an art major. Um, so we used that as our profile picture and the header on our Facebook page. And I know what you're thinking, and I'm happy to say that yes, you can contact her and commission her via her Instagram listed here. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we have the accounts made and all of that set, uh, we have prioritized answering those questions of who, what, where, when, why, that I'm sure many people might have not even known what the Hudson Bay was, you know, any of that detail. So the what was answered by the bios on both of those accounts. We started right off the bat by posting personal bios of each of us so that people could get to know who we are. Where and when was answered by a little route post that people really loved, uh, detailing where we were going and our timeline and the mileage and all those uh, details. And then Chrissy put together a video explaining our inspiration for the trip and why we were hoping to embark on such a grand adventure um, from our prior experience. So now I'm gonna go into my approach to posting on trail since we obviously were not going to have internet for much of the trip and at this point as I'm posting our planning process we've got a lot of people interested in our trip and want to hear from us. Uh, so what I did was while I was posting our planning and preparation process I was also making posts to with the help of a friend scheduled to be posted while we were on trail. I put those all into Instagram so that all she'd have to do was log in and hit post find the post on the specific date um, and so when I called her and gave her the information, that's when I found out that those drafts do not save to the account, they save to the device. So she didn't have any of that. So then I scrambled and came up with the idea of using a Google Drive, which you could see a little screen cap here of, where I would upload the photos and then put in the comments of that photo the caption for the post. Unfortunately, those post chronologically, so then she would have to do some digging, making sure that she had all the pictures for that post. Uh, wasn't super ideal. 
So I wouldn't recommend that route, but I would recommend, and what I was shown by someone who was also paddling to the Bay that summer, Madison, uh, is Meta Business Suite. It's operated by Facebook. It links both of your accounts together. You can schedule your posts. You see all of your messages in one place, all of your comments in one place. It would have saved me a lot of trouble. <laughs> and I uh, definitely would and, yeah, suggest using that if you're potentially planning on creating an account. Um, Madison was one of the first people that we met uh, through our social media accounts, and she also had some connections in uh, Norway House that made that experience far different um, than it would have been if we hadn't had that, um, which of course is on the pages in more detail. So I'll just kind of go through some of those more examples of when, how those accounts influenced our trip. One of them was our first River Angel, if you're not familiar with that, just kind of somebody that helps you along your trip. Uh, Frank messaged us on Facebook and offered us his backyard. You can see in the back there a little bit, uh, it literally leads right up to the Rainy River, which is where we were launching from there. Um, so it was very appreciative to have that place to crash and just be able to get going. He also lent us his car while we were there, which made grocery shopping a dream, um, made our experience in I Falls a lot nicer than if we were to just roll up and you know be acting on the fly. A woman named Gail Rowe works with Path of the Paddle. She reached out to us on Facebook and in her first message just gave us a whole host of information on the area, uh, which was much appreciated. And it went even further by putting us into contact with her partner Garth, who swung by the campsite and gave us physical maps that had campsites of where we were going to be going in the coming days, which we weren't exactly positive of where those were going to be. Of course, we would just set up wherever. So uh, it was appreciated, not necessary. And then that went even further by putting us into contact with the group that was actively doing the Path of the Paddle route in reverse. Um, and they were able to swing by the campsite and giving us live information of the record high water levels that they had just experienced that we you know, didn't know what to expect with those rapids and what they would actually look like. So that was super beneficial and all because Gail reached out to us on Facebook. Cher reached out and insisted that we swing by the museum that she works at. They gave us a quick tour, some snacks. It was really sweet. Um, and then she put us into contact with her cousin who met with us on Lake Winnipeg later on. He swung by with some food and some great information that was relevant to the lake ahead as well, which again, wouldn't have been possible if she hadn't reached out on Facebook. We talked to a reporter after that who had found us via our email on the page, and so we ended up being in their local newspaper, The Clipper, which was a really neat experience. And then after that, we swung by the home of a couple who had found us on Facebook. And while we don't have any pictures with Grant and Melissa, I made sure to snag some of the amazing grub that she made for us. <laughs> it was so appreciated. Such a nice little break in the town um, before we embarked on Lake Winnipeg uh, at that point. So it was really, really amazing how the trip was being influenced by that. Save the Boundary Waters reached out to us via Instagram. We were able to have an interview with them and a little article made, as well as being featured on their adventure advocacy page. They've got a booth here, make sure to check it out. And then as far as businesses that I reached out to, Brainstorm Bakery gave us that granola that Jackie mentioned that lasted us through the end of the trip. Total Bowl gave us some epoxy to bring some new life to the Champlains before we started on our three month journey. Wintergreen gave us the very hats you see us wearing now and Ely Minton Project sewed together some four bags with some cute little uh, custom decals on them as well. And then lastly, and potentially the most influential aspect, uh, early on in the trip, finding the daunting price of the five grand jet boat, all being fresh out of college and seasonal workers. Uh, we decided to put together a GoFundMe in case anybody was interested in supporting us. Um, and we met our goal and then some, and who knows what that would have been like if we didn't have our social media to plug that a little bit. So uh, definitely would recommend if you're planning a trip of really any length, I'm sure there's somebody out there that's interested in what you're doing and would love to help you. And you never know how it might result in changing your trip itself. All right, no matter the length of time that your trip is gonna be, a good amount of time should be spent researching the rules you might have to follow along the way. My name's Chrissy, I'm from Cooper City, Florida, and my role in the trip planning process was to look into all the regulations that we should be aware of and follow along the trip. The two things I focused on were securing permits and figuring out the border crossing. In addition to this, I knew there was gonna be a lot of things that I didn't know that I didn't know, so I spent a lot of time just generally researching the route and learning as much as I could about the places we'd be traveling through. We only ended up needing four permits for camping for the whole trip, and I got those online in advance in late January, early February. Um, for Minnesota and Ontario, aside from these permits and uh, ask, asking to camp on private land and a few daily uh, or a few walk-up campsite fees, um, yeah, got us all the way through Minnesota and Ontario. And so my advice to you is when planning a trip, uh, make, tr make permitting at the top of your to-do list because depending on where you go could make or break your trip. Uh, traveling through Ontario, we found the Crown Land Use Policy Atlas to be really helpful in figuring out where exactly we could and couldn't camp when we were traveling through Lake of the Woods and also parts of the Winnipeg River. 
And then in Manitoba, since we'd be on less commonly traveled waterways and wildernesses, um, all we had to do was report our trip to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and I did that through their contact form on their website. And then also I ended up, I had to email the York factory staff so that way they'd be aware of um, the time that we'd be arriving. So how on earth did I figure all this out? Well, I sent a lot of emails, uh, I read a lot of forums, I scoured Google Maps, and I poured over park websites. Uh, it was super helpful to have a finished itinerary to work with because then I could go through the trip day by day and see approximately where we would be camping that night. Uh, and then I could, um, if I had any questions after that, then I could email park staff, local outfitters, local business owners, and uh, members of indigenous communities to just figure out what I needed to know about camping and passing through that area. So we took all that information and then I put that into a document where I listed chronologically the towns and uh, the parks that we'd be passing through and I kept track of any costs and contact information and the website I got it from. And I took a condensed version of all this information on the trip with us so that way we could refer to it as we traveled along. And then a couple other considerations is I made sure we had fishing licenses for Minnesota, Ontario, and Manitoba, and made sure our canoes were licensed for Minnesota. Now for border crossing. Um, I spent a lot of time on the Canadian government website. When a trip is gonna take you into a different country, it's a good idea to know exactly what you can and can't take with you. Uh, and also for our trip, since it was at the tail end of COVID, I was keeping an eye on the ever-changing uh, COVID procedures. And so what was really helpful was just looking through web pages, looking at tables, and then when I still had questions, using that contact form on the website to get the exact answer uh, that I was looking for. Uh, what was not helpful was uh, speaking to a call to different call agents on the Canadian Border Services Agency website uh, because, especially regarding to regarding firearms, uh, in the end, long story short, we couldn't take our shotgun with us. Um, our advice to you is to speak directly to the the agents at the port you'll be crossing at. Um, we were given the runaround on the phone, some different answers, and could not get a hold of the Rainy River border crossing agents. Um, but if we had been persistent enough and had got a hold of them on the phone, we would have learned that the actual form on their website was outdated and that we wouldn't be able to renew our firearm after 60 days over the phone and that that policy had changed and that you have to renew it in person according to that port. Things can really vary from port to port and agency to agency, so talk with the exact port you're going to. And some additional considerations that uh, made sure that I looked into or somewhere else regarded a protocol with aquatic invasive species and also developing an emergency action plan. Uh, just for some reference, that was not one of our canoes we could approach <laughs> on that rock. While we were on the Hayes River, we came across uh, two different abandoned boats from um, canoe trippers that had to be either e self-evacuated or had to get someone to come evacuate them. So for us going into the trip, we made sure we had resources on rescue as well as information on emergency medical treatment facilities that we'd be for areas that we'd be passing through. We carried a hefty first aid kit, but we wanted to make sure we knew who we could call, where we could go if we did need help. And so having a thorough emergency action plan could be the difference uh, between life or death. So we wanna make sure we had all that information covered. In addition to the six roles that each of us had, these are three of the books that we read uh, as part of our planning process. We we're very familiar with the Boundary Waters, but north of that, especially Lake Winnipeg and north of that would be a very new environment to us and pretty remote. So these books helped give us an idea of what to expect. On the same token of being in a very new to us environment and being remote, we agreed to adopt what we called an expedition mindset. One of the things that this involved is that if any one of us in the group felt that another person in the group's actions were unsafe or that water conditions were unsafe to paddle in, that would settle it for the whole group. We were too far from help to take unnecessary risks. And we recommend that anybody who's uh, planning a big canoe trip sit down before the start of the trip uh, with everybody on that trip to talk about a, a group contract and, and these kind of things in mind. Um, we believe that, that being on the same page at the start of the trip, at least on a few points, can help mitigate uh, arguments down the line when things get complicated during the trip. Um, we had talked about doing a group contract uh, at, at various points in our planning process, but didn't end up putting ours into writing until we all met in person, which was just 10 days before the start of our trip. We began our rendezvous in Hibbing, Minnesota at Amos's house to begin our all of our hectic last minute planning and preparations. 
If this involved waterproofing our maps, building our spray skirts, testing our gear, organizing our first aid equipment, and so much more. This is our chalkboard to-do list of everything in those 10 days. It includes uh, packing and organizing our shelf-stable food, buying our fresh food, last-minute logistical phone calls, whitewater practice, target practice, the list goes on. But all of that hectic planning disappears the moment the trip starts because at that point it's too late to worry. And that's not to say that everything went perfect on our trip because of our planning. We still had maps disintegrate in our fingertips when it was rainy. We still had challenges getting our firearm across the border. We still had uh, gear fall apart while on trail and we had to last minute camp in people's yards. But we do believe that, that the planning that we did do made the trip a big success. And uh, uh, one of our final slides, we're just gonna to touch on some of the, the key notes that we think made our planning really successful. One is that from the very start of the process, we knew where we wanted to start and where we wanted to end and could move from there. We also, from the very start, knew that all six of us were committed, which meant that we could distribute the planning into those six different roles. Um, of course, with all of those roles being interconnected, it was critical that we meet every week to share our developments so that all of those roles could progress. And as far as, as these last points go, um, paddlers really like to help out other paddlers to help people do big trips like this. So we found lots of resources uh, from other folks, either know-how, knowledge, gear-wise, and, and other things. Also, as far as people that we met along the trip that were effectively strangers to us, our social media presence played a big role in meeting locals along the way uh, who, who were able to give us uh, know-how and, and what we're grateful for, their generosity. And finally, we recommend anybody who is doing a, a big canoe trip to sit down and, and make a group contract. But how did this trip start? It started with the planning, but before that, it started with a dream. It was uh, one day, five of us were, were sitting around um, already good friends and with perhaps a little too much time on our hands. <laughs> and we were at this point just Boundary Waters guides sharing our wildest ambitions. And we could have easily at this point dismissed this trip as being too ambitious. But we looked around and realized if all of us were in, that we could make this happen. And we understand that not everybody can do a whole summer of canoeing, but even as far as one week trips go, two week trips, we hope that what we've shared today proves that it's not too late to start planning a big canoe trip for this summer right now. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to, to take questions at this time. Uh, it, it is our, uh, if you have to rush out, this is our, our handle at Facebook and Instagram, Think Bon Voyagers. And if we're not able to get everyone's questions, we'll be out in the hallway afterwards. Yeah. So, well, during your scheduling, you, you said you had mentioned that you guys had planned in some weather bound days, but you also had to meet kind of your criteria about getting. Uh, so, how did that, how did the weather bound days play into uh, getting to your endpoint? Uh, did you get there early or? or so. It was, it was a weird it was a weird thing. Um, we actually got quite ahead of schedule on Lake Winnipeg, which is where we expected to use most of our weather-bound days. Um, so what ended up happening was in the last about month of the trip, we had to take a lot of layover days um, to make sure that we didn't get to York Factory too early. Okay. Um, the itinerary, the way I worked it out, um, we had the paddling days, and at the very end was just placeholder, a week of placeholder days. So in my head, we would be able to toss those in wherever we needed on the trip. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, we didn't really have to use those as much as we thought we would. Yeah. yeah. Um, how did you learn to paddle whitewater? Uh, on the trip for a lot of it. <laughs> if we could have Blake Free stand up for a second, he took us for yeah. one day of whitewater practice before the trip. <laughs> But, but really, truly, we were pretty inexperienced, except for Christy had done a little white water and taught some, some white water to youth. Elijah had done a little bit, and then we had that one day, and really, truly, um, taking it slow and, and trying to learn as much as we could as we were going. And really cool people we met along the way that led us to do some dumb things. Um, like run rapids, we shouldn't, but we learned from it. But really, truly, just literally talking to paddlers who are busy surfing waves on this big rapid, they're like, oh, just come with us. Um, so a little bit of prep. That would be something I don't know that I would have changed about the trip if we had a year to plan instead of six months to spend more time practicing whitewater so we'd have more fun on the whitewater. 
And the spray skirts helped a lot with uh, feeling comfortable yes. doing that without uh, practice or without yeah. experience. Yeah. So another question. So you guys expressed some uh, issues with the, the shotgun and stuff. What did you guys wind up doing in terms of with the bears? Uh, and oh, I mean, what what happened with that? Um, so in Kenora, we were it's Kenora, right? Yeah. We were able to go to a store and purchase uh, bear bangers and bear spray there, and so we ended up buying maybe more bear bangers and bear spray than we had thought we would bring. Um, but for the most part, and then at the end of the trip, we really sped up our, our time through the polar bear territory. So that way we really were only sleeping one night in the spot where we thought it would be likely that there could be polar bears. And so yeah, and by taking some extra bear bangers and spray and going quickly at the end is how we- You guys didn't have any issues with bears? Nope. No. So bear bangers, uh, where do you get those? Uh, are they available pretty much? That's not yeah. shotgun shells, is it? No. it? It is and it isn't. So it's a really good question. So bear bangers is kind of a brand. Um, there are bear banger shotgun shells, but what we got is a bear bangers, a little pen contraption you shoot in the air. We actually have something to show you guys later. Shoots up and explodes. Really hard to find where to buy them in the States. We crossed the border and the first Canadian tire, the hardware store sold them. Mm -hmm. um, so the Canadian Tire is truly where we got the bear bangers. That's the best place. It's almost not worth trying to find a place to get them here. But yeah, and the well, idea was that every person would have just order them online and they'd ship them. But no yeah. problem. Came to them across the country. Yeah. Yeah. Did you did you have a gun yet or not? We we started the trip with a shotgun, but at the border they would not let it let us take it across. We had all the paperwork we thought we needed. We did okay. plenty of calling beforehand, but we couldn't get it across the border, so we had to leave it in the states. And that was a there was a staff doing the paperwork too. Did they have a form that was inaccurate or something? Yeah, the form is still inaccurate online. Actually, it says that um, you can renew the permit for your firearm after 60 days by just calling a number. But we were informed by our border crossing agent that you actually have to return to the port of entry that you crossed at to renew that permit. <laughs> so we were not going to do that. And, uh, <laughs> that was really the only reason we couldn't bring the gun to yeah. because we declared to them we'd be in the country over 60 days. Yeah. Guys, I have a question. In the end, did the trip did the trip meet your expectations? Was it the dream? <laughs> I'm serious. It was, it was really, it was a big trip. Yeah, I mean, what one thing that, just as far as the like going starting the trip without uh, confidence in whitewater for a lot of us and and other things in in similar veins, we really feel like we leveled up, so to speak, so many times over the course of the trip. So. Yeah, a was. resounding yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, how did you uh, manage like uh, Winnipeg then? What was your strategy to have to you know, get through in brick and ahead of time? So I can, yeah, or, yeah, go I, I, I'm, the only piece I'll add to that is a big part of strategy. A big part of that strategy was the expedition contract. Now we were all on the same page about when we would paddle and when we would not paddle if someone was feeling uncomfortable and luck. A, a typical day on Lake Winnipeg was getting up at three in the morning, paddling until about 10 when the wind got too strong to at least whether, even if we felt safe paddling at it with the spray skirts, it just was too much of a headwind to feel worth the effort. Um, we would pull off to the side, spend midday wind bound, and then sometimes not until after dinner would it settle down enough that we would get back on the water. And we checked the Garmin inReach a lot to get a wind forecast too, yeah. which was a good idea. It helped us to convince ourselves, okay, if we rest now, it should calm down by the evening. This is what the little little weather device is telling us. Yeah. So with, with your packing of the food, how many, I saw in the photographs you guys had four barrels? Yeah, four bear barrels. And then you said 18 days was the longest that you went? Mm -hmm. And that was, oh, that was through uh, Lake Winnipeg. Okay. Uh, and at that point we had to, um, kind of modify the menu a little bit. We did like a lot of rice and beans, like things that were easily packed. Mm -hmm. um, but at that point, we weren't portaging a lot either, so we could. And then when you guys were doing at the near the end, when you were like resupplying at the local stores and stuff, and uh, what, what did you normally? I mean, what was the uh, uh, stuff that you could kind of find? Like ramen and rice, or it was it wasn't too crazy different than what we had. Um, I think that the hardest things were the protein sources, um, so like 
they didn't have like a lot of meats and stuff so like canned meats or like whatever we could find was just like we had available so if it only had one brand of one thing available we just buy a lot of that and then just have that <laughs> I, I have a question okay well, yeah, yeah. Well, heads up, we, have, we have time for one one more one question more. then we'll take it in the hallway I and mean, I think I saw somebody in the back at it oh, okay. and, and <laughs> that's his dad for this people might don't know <laughs> <laughs> we'll have another session later Okay, take it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, first I want yeah. to say, I think it's amazing that you guys did this trip and did it so well. I don't know a lot of teams uh, in business or in my life that have worked together so well and made this uh, uh, come true. And in such a, it sounds like you, it was easy for you guys. That's <laughs> <laughs> it, what it sounds like. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, so my question is, uh, before the trip, did you did any of your parents were they concerned about you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. My parents were pretty used to this kind of yeah. kind of behavior, so they they're like, oh, no, it's so. so they get they parents get used to it. It sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.